In this session, we're going to cover the normal distribution. So in a previous video, we found that the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function e to the minus x squared dx was equal to root pi. And we found this using a squared polar substitution three-step method. What we also now know is that this function, e to the minus x squared, is very useful for modeling probability in random variables. So what we're going to do is use a modified form of this function to construct what we call the normal distribution. Now what you need to remember is that the normal distribution is not normal or usual or typical. It is called normal because of some of the details of its derivation. Okay? And one way to remember that is that we're going to normalize our expression in two ways. So the normal distribution looks like this. 1 over, let's get it right, sigma root of 2 pi multiplied by e to the minus x minus mu squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Okay? This expression here looks a bit complicated, but I think you'll see quite quickly what it means. Right? So two things. The first thing is that when we set this value sigma to 1, what we want our function to have is a uh, standard deviation of 1 also, which means that this variable sigma variables, this variable sigma corresponds to the standard deviation. And the other thing we need it to have is that for any value of mu, which is our mean, and sigma, which is our, now our standard deviation, we need the total area under our curve to always be 1, because, of course, the probability of all possible events must be 1. Okay? And you can see that that's where this root pi comes in here. It's taken from up here. So this form of our normal distribution allows us to manipulate the curve in two ways. It allows us to make it fatter or thinner, but it also allows us to make it translate it along the x-axis using our value of mu. OK, so when we've got the function now, it still looks like the bell curve that we saw before. OK, but we are now able to modify these two variables. So if I said, so if we've got the values of sigma and mu, this purple curve, this what we call the standard normal, has got sigma equals 1 and mu equals 0. So it's 0 here. OK? But we could now, for example, change sigma to equal 2 and keep mu at 0 for now. And what that's going to do is make our function broader. OK? But you'll notice that the tails are now higher than the tails in the previous curve. And that's because the area under the curve has still got to equal 1. Another alternative is that we could keep the standard deviation at 1 and move our mean over to 2 and see what happens there. And that should look something like this. Okay. Like this here. And obviously this is going to extend out. So there's just three examples. You can put any values you want as the standard deviation and the mean, and you will still have 1 as the total area under your curve if you use this formulation. Right, so we want to make use of this to model some random variables. So what we're going to have to do is try be able to work out how to integrate finite regions under our curve. So we've seen that we can integrate between these infinite limits. But if you remember when we did the Gaussian integral, these limits were absolutely crucial to us being able to do the integration at all. Okay. We don't know how to do this integration between finite limits. We don't have that same method, the same tricks. So let's introduce this function called the error function, the error function, that is abbreviated to ERF, ERF, the error function. Okay, And it looks like this. It's written in this form. 2 divided by root pi, the integral from 0 to x of e to the minus t squared dt. And you might be thinking at this point, what's t? Where did t come from? Who, who introduced t? So t is what we call a dummy variable. You notice it doesn't appear outside the integral at all. And when we integrate something between a limit where x is going to get substituted in for t, 
the t is just going to disappear. So all the t is there for is to allow us to manipulate x in a certain way. So here is our error function. But I've just told you that we don't know how to do this integral. So what's the point of defining it at all? Well, what we do, and what you'll see from a previous video about power series, is that we use a Maclaurin series to represent the function. So we, can, we know how to differentiate this thing. In fact, it's quite straightforward. So what we'll do is we'll write this Maclaurin series. And that is, in fact, if you asked your computer to evaluate the error function, that's very likely how your computer is going to be doing it as well. So the Maclaurin series for this function looks like this. 2 over root pi multiplied by x minus x cubed over 3 plus x, whoops, x to the 5 over 10 minus other terms. Okay, infinitely many terms, and when your computer evaluates it, it's going to choose, maybe it'll take the first 10 terms and only evaluate those, which is what called a truncated series. Obviously, it couldn't evaluate infinitely many terms uh, because that would take infinitely long. So we now have a method for evaluating this thing called the error function, which looks like this. So our error function is going to be evaluating from 0 to x. So I'll point x here. So it's going to be evaluating this region here of a normalized curve. So actually, the area under this function would be 2, because it's been divided by root pi, so that makes it 1, and then multiplied by 2. OK? This is just by convention that we define the function this way. However, now that we've got this function, we can now start to think about probabilities again. So if we were using our normal distribution to represent the probability of a random variable, we would call it a PDF, a probability density function. A PDF. OK? And the height of our PDF at any point does not tell us the probability, OK? To find a probability, we have to integrate the area underneath it, which we, and so to do that, we need something called a cumulative distribution function, a CDF, OK? And so for the normal distribution, we can write down the expression for this CDF. So our CDF is going to be the following. So we get, it's a half times 1 plus the error function, earth, of, let's get this right, x minus mu divided by sigma root 2. OK? 1 half of 1 plus earth x minus mu over sigma root 2. OK? This function allows us to evaluate what the area of our normal distribution is all the way up from minus infinity up until our desired point. And if we were doing a probability type uh, use of the function, we could say that it's the probability that a random variable would be less than our value of x that we've chosen. This function gives us our probability up to the point. So using this concept, and what that gives us looks like this, Right, so we've now got our distribution like this. And if our x was down here, we would be getting all of the area, a bit of a wonky distribution, we'd be getting all of the area from minus infinity all the way up to that point. So using that concept, we can clearly do several other evaluations. So if we now wanted to evaluate, and I'll get rid of this lot up here, if we now wanted to evaluate this, expression, or this section of the graph, we wanted this thing up here, normal distribution, we've got point x here, but this time I want to have the bit greater than x, okay? So I can do the bit below x with this expression, but to get greater than, well it's actually quite simple, I just do that the probability so for this one, the probability that my random variable is greater than x is just 1 minus the probability that it was less than x. 
because we know ooh, less than x. Because we know that we know how to work out this side of the area, and we also know that the total area must be 1. So this side is just 1 minus. Using these two concepts, we can now do the next one, which would look like this. So now we want to know the probability in an interval. Right, so we now have got xA, xA here, and xB over here. And what if I want to know the probability of being in this region here? Okay, so between xA and xB. Well, all I do in that case is say the probability of being between xA, so I want my random variable to be greater than xA, but less than xB, I would just write this. I would say, well, it's like the probability of being less than xB all the way down to minus infinity, xB, all the way down to here. It's like this minus the probability of being less than xA. Here's xA, xA just shading this little tiny region down here. This minus this is this distribution here. So to get this expression, I would just say that it is, let's make some space, the probability of being, so this equals the probability of our random variable being less than xb minus the probability of our random variable being less than xA. Okay, so that's how we do this one. And the last case scenario, the last case that we're going to look at, is we've got a distribution here. doesn't matter where it is relative to the axis. Okay, and we want to know the m bits. That's xA. This is xB. We want to know what's the probability of being outside of a certain interval. Well, clearly probability of our random variable being less than xA plus the probability of our random variable being greater than xB, oh, sorry, less than xA, greater than xB, that's just going to be 1 minus this one up here. So that is just going to be, rub this one out, probability, it's 1 minus the probability of being within the range. x, x, b. Okay, so now that you've seen those four different examples, what we're going to do is run through a quick numerical example. Right. So what we're going to think of is the heights of students in a class. So we've got a class, and the class has 100 students. And their average height, their mean height, mu, equals 100 students. And their mean height is 1.7 meters tall. And the standard deviation of their height is 0.2 meters tall, so that's 20 centimeters. Okay, so using these three pieces of information, I want to know how many students will we expect to be between 1 meter 25 and 1 meter 45. We've got 100. We know something about their distribution. We've modeled the distribution in the class. What, what, how many students would we expect to find that range? So first we're going to find the probability, and then we're going to combine that with how many students are in the class. So here's our class. Okay, and I'll draw it along. So if we said that the axis was zero over here, so 170 is going to be something like this, 170 over here, and we're going to have a distribution. Don't forget this thing goes infinitely far in both directions. It's going to look something like this. Right, I'm probably going to regret drawing it in the middle of the board. Okay, so with our mean, the top of our peak at 170, and what we've asked for, we'll get rid of this, is what are the odds 
not one of the answers. How many students would we expect to find in this band here? So from 1.25 up to 1.45. It's probably a bit further along like that. Okay, what is the area of that region there? Okay, multiplied by how many students are in the class. So here we have, we've formulated the question. We've turned the words into their sort of symbolic representation for the normal distribution. And now what we're going to do is crunch the numbers. So we can rewrite the expression for the interval in the following way. So the probability of being between 1.25 and 1.45 can be written like this. So equals a half. Oh no, let's write it in its in its two section expression first, is equal to the probability of our variable being less than 145 minus the probability of our variable being less than 125. Okay? And we could write our expression that involves earth twice. So we're going to do this. So this equals one half times one plus earth, the error function, of x, so we've got 1.45 minus the mean, 1.7, divided by root 2, root 2 times the standard deviation, which is 20, times 0 0.2, okay, minus 1 half times 1 plus the error function of 1.25 minus 1.7, divided by root 2 times the standard deviation. OK, so we've got these two expressions. We can crunch them together. So actually, these 1s cancel. And we end up just with this. So equals 1 half times the error function of, so 145 minus 1 1.7 is minus 0 0.25 divided by root 2 times 0 0.2 minus the error function of uh, 1.25 minus 0.7 is 0 0.45, not minus 0 0.45, divided by root 2 times 0 0.2. OK. And now we just need to evaluate these things. So if I just put the error function of this number into MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha or whatever, I will come out with... This, which is going to be, this thing is minus 0 0.7887. And this thing here is minus 0 0.956. OK, and uh, there's more digits here. Uh, and then I just do the subtraction and multiply it through by a half. And I get that the probability, this probability here, equals 0.093. So we'd expect about 9% of our class to be in this height range, which means that if we've got 100 students, the expected number of students to be in our height range that we drew and rubbed out would look like this, 1.7. 1.25, 1.45, shaded region is going to be nine students. Nine students. That is our expected value. Okay?